Hi, my name is Brett Jenks. I'm the president and CEO of Rare. We're at our uh, annual staff retreat, and we invited uh, one of our partners, Nigel Asquith, who's a Oxford-trained, Harvard fellow, who spent a lot of time in Bolivia working on working at the grassroots level to uh, find incentives for farmers upstream to protect forests in order to preserve water flow to farmers downstream. Really interesting bright spot in conservation that our, our team is working with Nigel to replicate in a number of sites throughout the Andes. So through this interview, you can get a sense of what Nigel's been working on and his philosophy and his approach, or you can look at some of the other resources on Rare Planet for the actual case study or a short video uh, that actually shows you uh, his experience. So Nigel Asquith. My name is Nigel Asquith. I work for the Fundación Natura Bolivia in Santa Cruz, Bolivia. What have you been working on lately? Right now we've been working on convincing local people that they should do a better job at protecting their water supplies because not only do those forests upstream provide water for them, but they're also providing habitat for wildlife, which is what interests us in the protection of wildlife. So we're working with water cooperatives, municipal governments, local communities to protect the forests for our interest, which is wildlife conservation, but their interest, which is water protection. So. Uh, what are you doing with Rare specifically? Right now with Rare, we've, um, we're building a partnership because we've been doing this type of working with the communities for five or six years and we've found out that it can be a very slow process to build support, to build municipal interest, to build the interest of the, of the local communities. So what we're trying to do with Rare is figure out how to jumpstart that process and make the, the social acceptance of this process a lot quicker. And, and what do you envision that looking like? Well, we'll be basically running rare pride campaigns around the concept of the forest being important for water, which is like the economic interest of the local people, but also being inter in important for species conservation. We're focusing on specific species in that forest and trying to link the idea that that not only is the forest an economic asset, but also it's something that the locals can be and should be proud of. And between the two things of creating the social interest, the social norm for conservation, we allow through the economics of people paying for their water and upstream conservation that we link the, the changing social interest in, in conservation with the economic ability to do that conservation. So, so give us a specific example. What, what's, talk, talk about one farmer in one town with, with uh, forest and then how the water, how he's linked to the water supply. Well, I work with one of my uh, favorite farmers is a, a man called Serafin Carrasco, who, who lives very close to the Amboro National Park in Bolivia. He has about six hectares of land, and currently he's protecting about four hectares of forest and working two hectares of land, agricultural production, working, uh, producing tomatoes, um, onions. But in those other four hectares, he's agreed to sign a contract with our institution that he will conserve his forest, and in compensation for that conservation agreement, that that, that solid legal agreement that he will conserve, he gets given a bee box, a beehive, an artificial beehive, um, and training in how to produce honey, so that gives him an alternative income to what he would get from, from cutting that forest. So he conserves the forest on the one hand, and we give him help to find an alternative development on the other hand. And it's, it's a contract, so he complies with it, his side, we comply with our side. So why doesn't he just clear those four hectares and make the money and do something with that? Um, he has an interest in doing that, but also he's, he's personally interested in conservation. He, he likes being in the forest, he likes the, the fact that his kids can walk and see the animals, but he's never really had the economic chance to do that. And so what we do by, by making these cons compensation payments is, is give him that alternative economic option that allows him to keep that forest. Why do you think this work's important? What, what, what inspires you to, to make this work for a few farmers in, in Bolivia? Because um, we work on this basically because we're working on areas that are very close to biodiversity conservation, important areas for biodiversity conservation like national parks. We're helping create a, a, a buffer or a barrier of conserved lands around the park which are being conserved by the private landowners who own those land next to the park. And so although it's perhaps small amounts of hectares involved in the system, they're protecting or helping provide a buffer to protect much more, much larger areas. What we Doing also with Rare is figuring out how to scale this up 
at a national level, both all the way across Bolivia, but also working in Andean countries, um, including Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia, where there's cultures similar enough, the situation's similar enough in terms of um, species, the cloud forest, the important forest, which are always covered in clouds, that provide the water for the municipalities. So we're scaling up with rare, and the only way we can scale it up is repli and by replicating it quickly is by having this the the pride campaigns which allow us to convince more people quicker of the the validity of the scheme why is this project important for um for nature what is it about this place this project's important where we work um one because we're helping protect the park which lies behind these private lands and the park we're we're working on or have been working in is amboro national park which houses eight 800 and something bird species, which is 10% of the birds on planet Earth. So it's very important the help the area we're helping protect. Within these forests themselves, there are species which um, have been identified as only living in these very small areas in these Andean cloud forests. These species are called, um, well, they're, en they're endangered and endemic to very small areas, and they've been identified by the Alliance for Zero Extinctions as species which are live in such restricted areas such as the the Andean cloud forest that if a small patch of cloud forest is cut disappears sometimes you know 15 hectares of one watershed once that forest disappears in these areas we're working with rare that species is gone forever so this is sort of the the tip of the global extinction iceberg if you will it's the most important area in the tropical Andes is where the world's greatest level of biodiversity is. The cloud forests where we work are where some of the most endangered species are. And by protecting those, we are, yes, um, in, in, in the uh, ground zero in terms of conservation. This, these are the most important areas. The problem with conserving just protection in that area is that there are people living there. And if we don't work with those people and figure out what economic tools can help them to not cut their forest down, they will cut their forest, those species will go, and that's it forever. So what we're doing with Rare, by in literally going to farmers one by one and convincing them about the scheme and working with small communities, working in the areas, grassroots, democratic conservation, is means that this is sustainable in the long term. And this is where the rubber hits the road in terms of conservation. It's not in the capital cities. And so what we're doing is basically working with the local farmers to get the people using these water resources, the people, the water users downstream, to start kicking in some money themselves for conservation. So in the long term, we no longer need our support, we no longer need rare support, because we'll have created that social interest in conservation, both from the upstream farmers themselves and the downstream people who are paying in their water bills to conserve the forest, which are the, the, the sources of water for the, for the town. And as long as those towns need water, they're going to be interested in protecting that forest. Our take is that conservation happens on the ground in the woods themselves, and that's where we have to get our feet muddy and actually work with the local people.